The Easter story starts, at least in the book of John, it starts with some specific words. In John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stole stone had been rolled away from the entrance. The Bible kills me sometimes. I mean, Jesus is risen from the dead, and we have this boring sentence that ends in a period. <laughs> you, you with me? The reason is, I believe, that it's so plain, so anticlimactic, is because Mary Magdalene didn't know re- Jesus was risen from the dead. She didn't know that Jesus was alive. She didn't know yet that everything had changed. If she had known the implications of the resurrection, if she had known that Jesus really had risen from the dead, I believe that the story would have opened a little more emphatically. It would have had a bunch of exclamation points and a bunch of different emojis that talked about how Jesus is risen, right? In fact, if Mary Magdalene would have known, she... The story might have had some words like come from uh, my friend Carolyn Moore who does know. When she thinks of the resurrection, she says, I'm inspired by this. I'm energized by this. Our hope is built on this. After the blood flowed and the body of Jesus was laid in the tomb, after the verdict was pronounced over his body, death, after the stone was rolled away and over the entrance the guards were posted, Jesus in his body tore down the door of hell, walked through it to the other side. Jesus kicked down the ultimate barrier that stood between humanity and eternity. Death no longer has any sting is what Carolyn wrote of the resurrection. Resurrection changes everything. Today we start our series, Hope Does, and over the next few weeks we'll look at the different things that that hope does in our lives, but today we'll focus on this, hope lives. Hope lives. Hope lives because Jesus lives. Sometimes we doubt it, don't we? Sometimes we doubt that Jesus really does live. How how could it really happen? Resurrection. Is our faith really rooted in resurrection? In in fact, even well-meaning Christian theologians have tried to find their way around to still have faith without the resurrection. I'll tell you about one of those in a moment. First, I want to tell you about how a a, a well-known criminal responded to this, and then how an atheist responded to this, and finally, how a seminary professor of mine, Dr. Wong, responded to this. I got to preach to Chuck Colson one time. Some of you know who he is. Watergate fame quite a few years ago. I looked out in the audience, I was like, is that Chuck Colson? But he was gone. Two weeks later, I met his son. He goes, yeah, dad attended worship with me. Here's what Chuck Colson says about the resurrection. A man who got caught in a lie and spent time in prison in the President Nixon Watergate conspiracy. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't even keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 fishermen could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Next comes a conversation between a Unitarian minister, and a man by the name of Christopher Hitchens, a famous atheist, um, one who wrote a book called God is Not So Great. The the minister from the Unitarian Church was sort of trying to get on Christopher Hitchens' side, and and she tells him in, in the interview, she says, the religion you cite in your book is more of the fundamentalist variety of religion. She says, but I'm not that type of Christian. 
I don't take the stories from the Bible literally. I don't believe in the doctrine of atonement, meaning that Jesus died for my sins. Do you, Christopher Hitchin, make any distinction between my faith and the faith that you try to defeat in your book? You know what he says back to her? He says, I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and Messiah and that he rose again from the dead and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, then you're really not a Christian in any meaningful sense, is what an atheist told the minister that didn't believe in the literal resurrection of Christ. Well, let me tell you about Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong was one of my seminary professors. Dr. Wong was a, a legend around Asbury Seminary a couple of decades ago. One of the reasons was Dr. Wong's general character and persona. Dr. Wong had served in the Korean military before he came to the United States and um, became a Christian and, and became uh, a seminary professor. And he would run across campus from class to class, quite often in suit and tie, run. And if you saw Dr. Wong in the hallway, he, w he was loving and friendly, but he was very abrupt. You might be walking down the hallway and you would say, hey, Dr. Wong, how's your day? He would go, hi, just keep on going, you know? That's who Dr. Wong was. But one day in his apologetics class, he was a little late class, and it was also the same day that news floated around the seminary that a famous theologian by the name of Rudolf Bultmann had died. Now, Rudolf Bultmann was well-intentioned, but he came up with the idea that the literal belief in what happened in history in the Bible doesn't matter as much as that we have faith in a story, in a narrative, in something that could give us hope. Do you hear what I just said? He based his whole theology on the idea that the stories in the Bible are not actually true, but that we can sort of maybe be resurrected because of this story about this man. Well, Dr. Wong comes into class, he's a little late, and he comes up front and somebody says, Dr. Wong, Dr. Wong, did you, uh, did you hear that uh, Rudolf Bultmann died today? Classic Dr. Wong. He steps up to his lecture podium, pulls out his notes, he goes, yes, Bultmann dead, now he know. Turn to page 69. <laughs> we don't have to wait to die to know that the resurrection is real. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ transfers into the resurrection of our lives. You ask me how I know he lives, I know he lives because he lives in me. Hope lives because Jesus lives. And in the famous words of the fiery black preacher, S.M. Lockridge, you guys know this, that's my king, I wonder, do you know him? Do you know him? Because Jesus lives, I can live. But resurrection, we find out, requires death. That's why we celebrate Good Friday because resurrection is coming on the heels of death. Resurrection requires death. Re resurrection requires death for Jesus. And in Romans, Paul shares about what it means to be resurrected with Christ. And it starts with death. Listen to these two verses. For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. 
That's our verse this week and our, our grab, gather, grow material coming up. But it asks us a question and it asks us to consider what is death? What, what, did, what does Paul mean right here? Death is surrender. Death is, is recognizing our sin. Death is trusting Jesus to forgive our sin and to set us free. Death is giving it up to God. Giving it all up. That's why in our baptism ceremonies, when someone goes under the water, the words that I say are dead and buried to sin. And then depending on what I think of them, I hold them down there for a long time. Or well, I'm kidding. But I say dead and buried to sin. As they come up out of the water, you say risen to new life in Christ. Because that's what happens when we give it up to God, when we surrender with God, when we are immersed in who God is instead of who we are, when we surrender our lives. What Paul is saying is that resurrection is rooted in death, that it passes through death, and that death is surrender. And when I surrender to Jesus, I die to self, and then Jesus brings new life, and Jesus brings hope. I give it up. I give it up. I give up my goals. I give up my job. I give up my education. I, I, I give up my dating habits. I give up my spouse, my children, my parents, my eating habits. I give up my friends, my church, my politics, my drinking habits. I give up my neighbors, my car, my house, my entertainment habits. I give up my team, my yard, my future, my financial habits. I give it to God through the death, but ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't just give it to anybody. I don't just give it away into nothingness. I actually give it to God. God takes it. God brings life to it. God brings hope to it. I don't do away with it. I don't have to give away my yard, my car, my house, my parents, my spouse. I don't give that away. I give it up to God and God fuels it with a new story for my life. You see, when I, when I give up my goals, they're risen to a lifelong vision from God. When I give up my job, it is risen to a work that is as unto the Lord. When I give up my education, it is risen to serve others and not just make me wealthy. When I give up dating habits, they are risen to become healthy and whole and pure and good and healing. When I give up my spouse, no laughing, it, our relationship is risen to become a gift from above. When I give up my children, they are risen to become a blessing from our Father. When I give up my parents, they are risen to be honored so that it is well with my soul. When I give up my eating habits, they are risen so that I actually eat things that are helpful to me. When I give up my friends, they are risen to become real instead of a desperate attempt at an identity. When I give up my church, it is risen to become a place I belong instead of a place I attend. When I give up my politics, they are risen to become a, a, a just order in society instead of a way to beat each other up. When I give up my drinking habits, they are risen to a place of abstinence or healthy moderation. When I give up my neighbors, they are risen to be seen as God sees them. When I give up my car, it is risen to a place of serving my needs and the needs of others instead of being an idol. When I give up my house, it is risen to become a home. When I give up my entertainment habits, they're risen to become intentional. What goes in comes out, y'all. When I give up my team, it is risen to become healthy competition instead of the meaning of life itself. When I give up my yard, instead of something to maintain, it becomes something I give thanks to for God's creation. When I give up my future, it is risen to a hopeful, alive, and purposeful place. On Easter Sunday, and every day of the year, hope lives because Jesus lives 
and Jesus gives us life. In fact, let me say this. Jesus gives us a touchdown. Anybody like touchdowns? Jesus gives us a touchdown. I got to sort of pull, pull back a little bit in the history of Ben Kathy's life. It has been pretty awesome, by the way. It's been an awesome life. But I got to pull back to my first car. It was a, a white Toyota Corolla hatchback. It was awesome. Bought from Marietta Toyota. Hand me down from mom and dad. Stick shift. A good little car. Well, one day I was making a right turn, round in a little fast, and I was in my lane, but a lady came over to my lane and she just her she just barely nicked the door. Just barely. Just a, but then the door wouldn't shut entirely okay it had about a half inch gap it would not lock it would not shut so so what did Ben Kathy do you don't take this to the repair shop what you do is you get a bungee cord (laughs) and you and you stick it down in this side over here and you stick it somewhere and you wrap the bungee cord around your headrest and you hook it into this headrest and problem fixed your door stays shut Y'all, I got to tell you that this whole scene worked really well down at Auburn in the dating years. It was like, it was like hey, babe, just, just a second. I got I to gotta put my bungee cord on. <laughs> at least I knew that nobody went out with me for my car, right? <laughs> well, one Christmas break, I was home. I, I got a job at Walmart. Would you believe it? They, uh, they gave me a job back in the electronics section. People would ask me questions. I'd walk up and read the little sign under the stereo. You know, I was like, yeah, that's 120 watt with four channels. Anyway, that was my job. I was a little late one morning over Christmas break. I, I didn't know I was young and dumb and, and I knew I was late to work. I didn't know that it was 33 degrees outside and raining and that you're not supposed to drive 70 miles an hour on Villarica Road. Are you with me? Well... I came upon this little bridge on Villarica Road. And you know that sign that says bridge freezes over before road? Well, that's exactly what happened. And my car completely lost control on this bridge. And I, and I remember sort of sliding into this bank and then the car turns. And, and I remember I was petrified and thrilled all at the same time because I remember my car sliding exactly sideways and I saw the speed limit sign and I sort of smiled because I was about to crush that sucker. <laughs> and I went right through the speed limit sign and then my car sort of heads off of this embankment and I, you don't remember what happens. Everything moves slow, but you don't remember. Somehow my car tips and turns and turns sideways. My door opens. It looks like an accordion. I get thrown out of my car and I was, instead of flopping on the ground, somehow I rolled up into a ball and I rolled several times across the ground until I stopped and then I stood up and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not hurt. And some construction workers and two soccer moms had stopped at the top of the hill near the bridge. And and they looked down on me and they say to me, are you okay? And I look back up at them and the only thing I can think to do at that time is I go, touchdown! (laughs) To which the soccer mom immediately said, were you wearing your seatbelt? And the construction worker said, dude, you're cool. You need to use my phone? (laughs) I share that story because I love sharing that story. (laughs) But I share that story because Jesus gives us a touchdown. Jesus is risen. And it doesn't matter if our life isn't working out that well, it doesn't matter if we're driving an old beat up car where the door doesn't stay shut with a bungee cord. Jesus gives us a touchdown. It doesn't matter if we're dumb and stupid and young or old and dumb and stupid and we keep making mistakes and we drive 70 miles an hour when it's 33 degrees outside and raining. 
It doesn't matter. Jesus still gives us a touchdown. In fact, it doesn't matter if I even made it through that. Guys, as a, as a young believer in Christ, if my body had been mangled, or if worse yet, if I would have died that day, Jesus still would have given me a touchdown because my eternity would have been secure with him. Because he has risen. Because in my life, I've chosen to die with Christ. And having died with Christ, I'll be risen with Christ. And in that words, in the words of that old black preacher, that's my king. That's my king. Do you know him? Do you know him? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you created us and that you love us too much to leave us alone. So God, I just pray that you, your spirit would be alive in this place, Lord. And God, that as we celebrate Easter, we, we would know you and know your spirit. God, I pray that somebody here today might see that new life. Not as a religious symbol, God, but as a reality. Not as something other people do, but as something I do. God, let us be risen in you. And God, where we need to, let us die to self. Let us surrender to you so that on the other side, we find resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.